Good morning and welcome to the uh, committee's fourth meeting in 2019. Could I just ask everyone to please make sure that their mobile phones are on silent. We're going to move to agenda item two on our agenda, which is the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. This is the committee's final evidence session on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, and I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his officials, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, Sandra Reid, the Bill Team Leader, uh, Karen Jackson, the South of Scotland Economic Development Team Leader, and Felicity Cullen, the Scottish Government Legal Director. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think you would like to give an opening statement, and I would ask you please to limit this to, to no more than three minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I'm pleased to give evidence today. The South of Scotland has a different and distinct rural economy. A new South of Scotland enterprise is uh, a great opportunity to do things differently for the South, building both on its strengths and its traditions. We want the agency to deliver a fresh approach to economic development, to unlock potential, to address opportunities and to respond to needs, to make sure that the South has the strong role in Scotland's economy that it deserves. This bill provides the structure and legal framework for a new body in the south of Scotland to drive inclusive growth. It sets out the high-level aims and powers necessary to enable the, power, the body to support that growth. It provides maximum flexibility for the new body to shape the activities it takes forward and to respond to the circumstances of the south. It's an opportunity to set the future direction for the south of Scotland, to drive the economy forward, with growth that creates opportunities for all, that sustains and grows communities and harnesses potential of people and resources. Our proposals have been developed through extensive engagement with the people who live, study and work in the South. Uh, around 250 people have replied to our written consultation, overwhelmingly welcoming the proposal and the ambitions for the new agency. Working with the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, we heard from 536 people at 26 engagement events across the South, uh, and we continue to work closely with stakeholders as the functions and shape uh, of the new body are developed to make sure it's accountable to the people of the South of Scotland. Um, we are responding to the needs ad interim by investing almost 6.7 million in the South of Scotland Skills and Learning Network delivered through colleges to provide better access to training to a wider range of students. Last week, uh, investment of £156,000 was confirmed to support the development of skills through training, developing land-based training across the south of Scotland. To conclude, uh, convener, as I'm sure that there are many questions for us today, uh, South of Scotland Enterprise will play a vital role in delivering our ambitions for the area driving forward inclusive growth and supporting the rural economy. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, and the first question today will be from Maureen. Maureen. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Um, when we have been taking evidence, and especially when we went to Dumfries uh, as a committee, um, there seemed to be a general um, dissatisfaction with the current operation of uh, Scottish enterprise in the south of Scotland. Um, I think perhaps a bit of a misunderstanding as to what Scottish enterprise is tasked to do and the differences between Scottish enterprise, business gateway and local authority functions. So um, I wonder why, if the Cabinet Secretary has got any uh, views on, on why this might be the case and also what... What does he expect of the new agency in the way that it will approach um, the enterprise problems in the south of Scotland? Um, well, I, I think it, it is the case that there is a desire for more of a, a locally accountable body. Um, obviously, a Scottish enterprise has, has worked hard to uh, discharge its duties across the geographical range of its responsibilities, which is the whole of Scotland other than the area covered by HIE. That's a massive area. Uh, a, a Scottish enterprise has a presence in the south of Scotland, but perhaps it may be perceived as not based in and of the south of Scotland. Um, it has done good work over the years, and when I was enterprise minister, I was involved in that. 
Uh, most recently, I was involved in working with Steve Dunlop and colleagues in relation to Spark Energy. Uh, I can assure you that the officers, senior and at all levels of uh, SE are devoted to their task and are good public servants and have done an awful lot of work to discharge their duties. But nonetheless, it is not a locally headquartered body. Uh, uh, and the second part of the question is that I believe that the new body based in the south uh, can be shaped and adapted to meet the, the local needs, uh, to work very closely with the business gateway and the local authorities. Uh, and uh, the partnership chaired by Professor Griggs has built up very good relations with the leadership of the councils and really all the agencies, particularly um, and particularly the colleges and universities uh, based in uh, the south of Scotland. So, so I'm optimistic that the new body will be able to provide that sort of local feel and accountability uh, and presence that perhaps Sc Scottish Enterprise, for all the good work that it's done over the years, uh, has been perceived by some not to have fulfilled. So in terms of the new body, it will obviously be tasked with growing indigenous businesses, which I think is, is key to uh, economic growth in the south of Scotland. What then will be the relationship in terms of inward investment? Are we then going to have HIE remaining part of Scottish enterprise and south of Scotland all competing for inward investment to Scotland? Or how is it going to work? Well, obviously, um, there is collaboration between the existing agencies. Um, for example, SDI, Scottish Development International, uh, very often takes the lead okay. and has the lead in respect of the, the sort of first contact with an inward investor, very often coming from its offices throughout the world. Um, the Strategic Economic Partnership plays uh, uh, an oversight role. Um, and I, in my experience, um, the bodies work well together when they require to. That there's not any real element of sort of poaching or, or aggressive competition in that sense, but rather collaborative working. So I don't think that's an issue. Um, I, I think uh, the, 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 there are opportunities for inward investment, but I think perhaps there's a feeling that the smaller businesses, which are the bedrock of the south of, south of Scotland rural economy, could have a closer relationship with the, the new body. And that particularly we reach out to the traditional areas of strength and build on those areas where there's in the farming community, in, in forestry, in tourism, in uh, a, a, a other areas, in transportation and logistics, there is an awful lot of, uh, uh, of uh, active small to medium-sized businesses, and I think the new body will better be able to reach out to those businesses and work more closely with them than the existing um, arrangements. And finally, for me, the, um, some, the problems and the issues facing the economy of Borders and Dumfries and Galloway uh, are also faced by the communities in South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire. Um, how confident are you, Cabinet Secretary, that these other rural areas in the south of Scotland um, will be adequately served by Scottish Enterprise? Um, well, I, I, I'm confident that they, they will be, and of course there was, quite rightly, uh, in the consultation stage, consideration given to the geographical boundaries that should apply. And in particular, consideration was given, I think, to the Ayrshire's and South Lanarkshire. Um, the Ayrshire's cooperate, the, the three Ayrshire councils cooperate, and of course the, the Ayrshire deal uh, is very much something that they're all working to achieve. And South Lanarkshire is uh, linked in with the Glasgow deal. Uh, and secondly, there's also proposals for regional economic partnerships, uh, which will ensure that there is a regional voice at all levels. Um, my view is that the majority response, both from people in the south of Scotland, the, the two, um, Dumfries Galloway and Borders, and also um, in Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire, is that the new body should be, have the geographical boundaries that it does with the two local authorities comprising the south of Scotland area. Uh, I think that was the prevailing view, the majority view, and that was the basis upon which we are proceeding. But mindful of the fact, and this is the last point I'll make on this question to answer Ms. Watt's qu uh, questions, convener, mindful of the fact that you know, there should always be and is close working uh, between uh, public sector bodies of all sorts at all levels. That's, 
That's the absolute key. Collaboration is the key to getting things done, to work in a positive, constructive, collaborative spirit. And I spent thousands of hours trying to do precisely that, working with colleagues and friends in local government. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you had a supplementary. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Just following on from this line of questioning, uh, and I, I, I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary has already said on close collaboration, that will be very welcomed. However, um, there is a, uh, a view perhaps in the Lanarkshire and Ayrshire authorities that because they uh, will sit on the wrong side of the boundary or the other side of the boundary of the new agency, that they will only be able to benefit from the existing uh, agencies and existing uh, setup, given that many of the criticisms that apply to those agencies already in the south of Scotland, in terms of the need for a new agency to serve the south of Scotland, um, what, what does the Cabinet Secretary think uh, those local authorities in those boundary uh, areas will be able to, uh, will, there, will there be any tangible difference to how they access services or will they be looking across the border to see things being done in a better way in the other two council areas uh, and then being stuck with the old system? Um, well, you know, we're, we're not proposing it that any local authority should have a, an inferior or, a, or a, a lower service and I don't believe that's the case and, you know, I have, with respect, um, convener, um, worked closely with Scottish Enterprise in respect of um, investments, proposals, businesses, a, in every part of Scotland, and most certainly in the Ayrshire's and South Lanarkshire over the years, not least in respect, for example, of the, um, uh, the steel industry investments, uh, of aerospace in uh, Ayrshire, of food and drink businesses in Ayrshire. I mean, I've seen it firsthand, and I've convened together with SE meetings in Ayrshire, uh, in many ways precisely to to provide a kind of local presence from time to time. Um, I mean, I could give the committee many examples if it wished, but I should I vigorously defend the role of Scottish Enterprise as a, covering all of its areas. Um, and I, I think that good work will continue, but uh, the opportunities in, in, uh, uh, in these areas, the, the growth deals in, in bordering areas provide one set of opportunities. I've got quite a lot of detail here about how that's operating. It's not my portfolio, but I can, I think I'll maybe just take that as read so that I'm not usurping too much of your time. Um, and the second approach is the regional economic partnerships are designed to ensure that there, there is a, um, a, 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 a good performance and economic development um, a, at every part. But, but, you know, I think Mr. Green raises a, a point that will be asked by lots of others and we have to keep a watching brief uh, to make sure that the, the bordering areas that will not be in south of Scotland enterprise area are, are not losing out. And I'm sure that that's an area we'll, we'll turn to, but we will monitor and keep an eye on as, as we proceed. Cabinet Secretary, uh, one of the evidence sessions that we heard was the importance of the new agency being able to encourage uh, businesses just out with the area that they represent so that businesses within the area that they represent benefit from the services, whether it's provision of skills or apprenticeships. Do you think that's something that, that is allowed for in the bill? Because I think, you know, the, the borders and the area that, that the agency will represent might have to rely on others to supply some of the, the raw materials that they need for their businesses. Um, well, yes, the, the, I mean, the, 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 there is a, a present uh, a flexible approach taken where there's, you know, there's, there's cross-border issues. I mean, let me give you an example, um, which may or may not be apt, but I mean, Glen Shee, for example, is just in the Scottish Enterprise areas, so that's, some members will know from the northeast of Scotland. But of course, the other four outdoor ski, ski uh, resorts are, are in the Highlands and Islands. And therefore, when we were working to try to assist the, the whole, whole five resorts, to avail themselves of finance to upgrade the facilities, Scottish Enterprise and HIE worked very closely together to work out a common scheme. And initially, they, they had two different ideas. But through collaboration, through talking, through discussion, through collaboration, um, they were able to come up with a, a scheme which ensured that, as I understand it, Glenshee was not disadvantaged compared with the other areas that, uh, within 
HIE. So, you know, when there's a real issue of, of importance, um, it's my experience that there's, there's no question about it. Ministers giving the oversight, uh, a chief executives running these important bodies all want to work together. That's absolutely at the heart of successful economic development, and that's the way that we, we all seek to work in Scotland, and generally it works, it works fairly well in, in practice. We can't foresee what's going to happen in the future. You know, situations will arise, but with that cooperative approach, I think we can, we can do uh, everything practical in, in most circumstances. I don't know if Karen Jackson or Felicity Cullen is keen to add something to the mix, if that's if, in order. If I may, Cabinet Secretary, just to add, the um, drafting of Section 7 of the Bill has been uh, done quite deliberately. It doesn't tie... The, the body is obviously going to be operating in, in the Dumfries and Galloway and the um, uh, Scottish Borders areas, but seven, Section 7 is deliberately framed to allow it to do things which are um, help it achieve those functions but are not limited to that area. So in the example the convener was giving where there may be a bit of sort of... <laughs> play or ply between an area that's just out with it but would benefit the south of Scotland area that's entirely available to the body to be able to do that. Perfect. That probably answers the, the, the question nicely. Uh, John, uh, Finney, I think yours is the next question. John. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the Bill is very welcome and uh, it's, it lays out the, the aims of uh, the south of Scotland enterprise and uh, if I may briefly say, AMA is further the economic and social development of the south of Scotland. And that's comprehensively explained by six points. Um, B, its second aim is to improve the amenity of the environment of the south of Scotland. But it doesn't explain that. Now, we've had a, a number of representations regarding this comment that the provision's weak. We've had a, a, a body such as the Solway Firth Partnership, the Southern Upland Partnership, suggesting um, what, what that should cover, um, it doesn't explain. Is, is that a shortcoming of the bill, or could you comment on that, please? Well, I think the, the aims in, in Section 5 of the, the bill are framed in a way which is designed to be pretty general and to cover just about everything. It's framed in a way that avoids delimiting or restricting the scope, uh, and that is done by avoiding specificity, by avoiding a long list of specifics. It's the current mode of, of uh, uh, drafting, uh, and that's deliberately so. Um, it contains, as Mr Finney says, some examples of furthering economic and social development, but these are illustrative, as we want to ensure that the body has sufficient flexibility to shape its activities. Uh, it, uh, it, it does, of course, refer, as the, the second of the, of the two aims, um, the, um, to improve the amenity and environment of the south of Scotland. Um, you know, that's the second of the two aims. I think the, the, the fact that there are two aims, one social and economic development or economic and social development, and the other amenity and environment in the south of Scotland gives it, if you like, uh, equivalence to economic and social development. Um, I don't think it's necessary uh, a, a, to have a whole long list of things that would be dealt with by way of of uh, implementing these powers. That's really, I think, convener for the action plan at a later stage to go into. But I think I can reassure Mr Finney that um, the framing uh, of the powers is, is I believe, um, done correctly so that it provides uh, the very widest powers for the agency to assist in uh, improving the amenity and the environment of the uh, south of Scotland. So. Um, you know, I, I, I obviously will, we may come back to this at stage two and we can have a more detailed discussion, but I'm extremely confident that this new body will have the power, if so advised, and if it decides to do so, to advance the immunity and the environment of the south of Scotland uh, uh, and to do that in conjunction with its uh, other aim. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is Jamie Green. Jamie. Thanks, Governor. Just following on from uh, Mr Finney's line of questioning, um, uh, I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary says around not being overly prescriptive on the face of the bill as to what the uh, what should be in the action plan and what the aims of the agency is in great detail. But this uh, has a sense of déjà vu. The Cabinet Secretary will recall uh, the, the work that the committee did on the Islands Bill. 
Um, and we had the same argument that things like uh, transport, connectivity, uh, digital connectivity, uh, whether or not they should or shouldn't be included on the face of the bill. Um, the feedback we got in, in the sessions that we had in the, in the south of Scotland were very much that those are two of the main issues, specifically digital and physical connectivity, and they should be addressed and they should be highlighted in the legislation. Why are they not at the moment? Um, well, the, the drafting of the aims is, uh, as Mr Green says, uh, framed in a, a very wide manner. And section 5, subsection 2, um, a, a, amplifies what is meant by economic and social development. It's including inclusive economic growth, providing, maintaining and safeguarding employment, enhancing skills and capacities, encouraging business startups and entrepreneurship, providing commercial industrial efficiency, innovativeness and international competitiveness, and supporting community organisations. Now, these are the aims of this body, but of course it works alongside Transport Scotland that has national responsibility for, for example, trunk roads and railways and other modes of transport. Uh, and it sits alongside the work that is being done by the Scottish Government in partnership with local authorities on R100 uh, in order to um, uh, aim to provide access to superfast broadband to all in Scotland and especially looking to these remote areas. So it's horses for courses, I think, at the end of the day. Um, we already have bodies that have the expertise in these other areas, and we expect that they should continue to carry out their work in those areas. And also, they have the budget uh, for transport and for connectivity. The South of Scotland won't have the budget to do that. It won't have the executive responsibility, and the budget, of course, follows that executive responsibility. But, and this is the last point I'll make, convener, as you know, I never wish to go on for too long, uh, but, yes, uh, feel free to laugh, <laughs> uh, but this is a serious point. I mean, it, it, I absolutely accept the, the concerns that Mr Green expresses will be those that one would hear at all public engagement meetings, yes. But the key thing is working collaboratively with all these other bodies and, where necessary, bringing them together to work together to deliver improved transport projects, to deliver R100 and that is indeed how to do things successfully. Uh, notwithstanding what the Cabinet Secretary said, um, surely, uh, again, I, I refer back to previous legislation where we had this very argument that we shouldn't be prescriptive. Uh, and it, uh, we ended up in a place where part two of the Islands Bill specifically says that improving transport services and improving digital connectivity, amongst many other things, is on the face of the bill. Therefore, it is incumbent on the agency to deliver on those, regardless of who owns the budget. So uh, we, there is precedent to actually putting these issues on the face of the bill. Could, uh, one could argue that there is still scope. If these are two very specific issues that the community wants to see in the bill, could appear in the bill. Well, you know, I'm, I, I'm, we, we will no doubt debate in, in stage two um, these matters in more detail. That's absolutely right. And Parliament and individual members are perfectly entitled to bring forward amendments. I wasn't myself. Uh, steering the Islands Bill through, so I can't speak from that, that knowledge or experience. I think the approach we've set out does in no way constrict the, the body in the achievement of these aims, but there is a risk, though, in, in setting out duties on a body with no budget. If one does that, then it, it can lead to raising unfairly expectations that a body in charge with duties doesn't have the budget to deliver. It just does seem as a matter of common sense that we should be canny about about doing that, um, and we should make sure and call to account, as I'm sure convener committees do, uh, Transport Scotland uh, and other agencies who do have the budget and the staff and the expertise, quite frankly, and the knowledge to, to deal with these things uh, and these important matters. So um, I guess this will be a conversation to be continued. Okay. Um Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The next question is from Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, on the aims of um, the new agency, we've touched on them already, and there's two separate parts to further the economic and social development and improve the amenity and environment of the south of Scotland. What timetable and criteria 
is there set out to assess whether or not the agency has been a success? Because for um, part A, the economic and social development, we then have uh, part two, which goes on in further detail to say how that's going to be achieved or what we want to achieve from it. But there's very little, if no detail, for the amenity and environment side of it. So how do we assess that? Um, well, obviously, the, the, the body hasn't yet been set up, so it, it needs to get it set up and, and uh, running. Um, the bill does provide for various formal requirements, which are all part of accountability of the new body. For example, an action plan in Section 6, for example, in um, Section 14, an annual report. Uh, I know, for example, that Councillor Elaine Murray was expressing the view that reporting back to the communities is extremely important. Uh, you know, I agree with that view. Um, and the more that a body communicates effectively with those who it serves, the better things tend to be. Uh, uh, so I would expect that, um, you know, as the body discharges its functions, it will, its performance will be assessed it will be accountable to ministers and, and through ministers to the Scottish Parliament. This committee will, of course, be able to call, as, as you can at any time, its office bearers to give evidence and scrutinise its performance. These are all tried and tested methods of accountability to assess performance. There are also the requirement, of course, to submit proper accounts and accounting records uh, and send a copy of, to the Auditor General. The new body will be subject to scrutiny by Audit Scotland entirely independent of government in the normal way. So that is how all these matters have been dealt with. I would expect the action plan to deal specifically with the environmental responsibility uh, and uh, that that will be form part of the scrutiny that I've mentioned by, by Parliament, by Audit Scotland. Uh, and a, a, with the emphasis being really on, I think, local accountability is particular desire that was, as I understand it, has been expressed both to this committee in its evidence sessions and to others in the course of the work leading to today. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Richard Lyle, yours is the next question. Morning, Cabinet Secretary and uh, panel. Can I turn to the powers of the new agency? The committee have received a submission from a former solicitor in the legal section of Scottish Enterprise. He expressed concern about the decision to exclude compulsory land purchase information gathering powers from the bill, believing these are important powers and should be clearly set out in the primary legislation. So can I ask, why does the bill not grant powers to acquire land by compulsory purchase, nor powers of entry to land and powers to obtain information? Should the agency not, as I know you wish, have the same powers as uh, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, as you have already said, to drive the economy forward? If they're all going to work together, should they not all have the same powers? Um, I think there's, there's a principal argument that there should be an equivalence of, of powers, but experience has tended to suggest that the powers of compulsory purchase have never actually been uh, used, either by Scottish Enterprise or by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, namely the way that they worked has never required these powers to be used. Um, we don't believe that the power of compulsory purchase is necessary for the South of Scotland enterprise. We expect the body will work collaboratively. Obviously, compulsory purchase is very much a last resort. In fact, it hasn't been a resort at all in other economic development agencies. Um, but the, the new body will have the ability to purchase and sell its own assets. It should be, it should be clear that that's the case. Uh, and to work with others who do have separate statutory powers, and that includes local authorities, I, I do know that both um, Brian McGrath from Scottish Borders Council and Elaine Murray from Dumfries and Galloway Council uh, have expressed the view that, that the arrangements we're setting out are adequate, that local authorities possess these powers. Working with local authorities is, is the way around that. Now, just in the sake of completeness, Mr Lau mentioned, I think, two other issues, the power to enter land and the power to require information. Um, I think I'd like to consider both of those aspects separately. Uh, this is obviously preparatory to stage one, um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to reflect on those individually. We've spent some time looking at compulsory purchase because there's been a lot of focus and discussion about that. Maybe we need to spend a bit more time looking at these other areas to see 
uh, whether or not uh, they, there is a need to do anything about those particular aspects. Uh, so we can come back to that, convener, if, uh, if I may. And if we have anything useful to add before stage one, we will write you there and then. Can I, I welcome your comments. I know that in previous bills you were pressed by members in regard to compulsory powers, and, and basically uh, I welcome the, the comments you've made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard. The next question is Colin. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning to the, the panel. I present the bill gives ministers the powers to appoint the chair of the agency, all the members of the board and the agency's first chief executive. But when gathering evidence on the bill, we've heard calls uh, for local communities and stakeholders to have more say on who is appointed to the board. Is this something you're giving consideration to? Um, well, the, the appointments are made on, on merit. They're regulated by um, the 2003 Act. They are, they are overseen by um, Commissioner for, Pub for Ethical Standards in Public Life. They are subject to the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointment to Public Bodies. Uh, the process for appointment convener, therefore, is, is one that is very heavily regulated by statute. Yes, ministers make the decision, but I think it should be made clear that that decision is very heavily influenced and circumscribed by the legislative framework that has been set out. And in practice, very often, the minister is really in the position of making um, approval of a set of recommendations that emerge from a structured process designed to provide fairness, transparency and accountability. And I can't emphasise that enough. Um, I, uh, and I, I also have heard uh, a, the evidence um, from Elaine Murray, for example, that she's less concerned about ministerial appointments and more about reporting back, going back to my previous issue. Maybe that's a point of view. It's one with which I have much uh, uh, sympathy. Um, plainly, we do need to, to appoint a chair and a chief executive um, if the bill passes stage one, preparatory to the setting up of the body. So this is done in stages. The appointment process and, of course, the full legislative uh, regulations will apply to the appointment of the chair and the chief executive uh, convener. I mean, it doesn't work that the minister picks whoever he or she wants. That's not how it works. Uh, nor would it be appropriate, and nor would I, would I you know, conceive of a proceeding in that way. There's a formal process which must be observed. Parliament set it out. We will follow it, and I believe it is fair. Last point I make in this, and I, think this is, I hope this is something that Mr. Smith and other members would welcome. Uh, I think we must make sure that we reach out to attract people in the south of Scotland, of the south of Scotland, particularly those who may not think of themselves as having a role as a, uh, a board member of this agency, but have an awful lot to offer. And therefore, the suggestions made by many, um, by leaders of, of the councils, I believe, and many others, that we should have a recruitment campaign that, that is advertised locally in local papers is one that we should pursue. There's a budget for this, and I'm going to ask officials, to, in order to deliver what I understand to be a commonly expressed view, the recruitment campaign should really reach out, not just in Dumfries, not just in Hoyk, but across the areas using local papers and other forms of communication, including, I expect, social media. Well, that's not my particular area of expertise, but uh, we must reach out to try to get people beyond the, the usual suspects. and. Um, it's not an easy thing to do because generally people that might have a lot to do are extremely busy doing what they're doing already. Very often, you know, running, um, running businesses or holding down important posts in public bodies. But I think there's been a common view that we should do that. So I'm determined that that, that should really be the practical way that we get the best calibre uh, and contribution of local people to the south of Scotland uh, enterprise. One of the key groups... Um, in, in that work, it's clearly going to be young people. We've got a huge problem of outward migration of young people in, in the south of Scotland and a real demographic challenge. So how, what mechanisms will be in place to, to really involve young people in the running of the agency? Well, um, I think there's a particular issue about, about young people just at a kind of, uh, at a kind of strategic level. And it's, it's common with the Highlands and Islands. Uh, is the propensity for young people to see their future out with their own area, you know, to see their career prospects and life 
um, being lived you know, outside south of Scotland, outside Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And I have to say, one of the successes of HIE and others has been to stem that trend. So I think for the first time, a significant majority of young people in the Highlands and Islands actually think they've got a future in the Highlands and Islands. That's a terrific thing. Um, so, you know, I think that's the overall strategic aim that we want to, to deliver. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure how many people necessarily want to be board members of South of Scotland Enterprise, but we should reach out to everybody to ensure that they have uh, a, an opportunity to, a, to, to do that. And we are engaged, of course, with organisations such as Young Scot and the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, and I regularly meet uh, uh, representatives of these bodies at various public events. So already they're, they're reaching out and playing a part in the, um, a, in the affairs of uh, public policy. And if there are other specific ways that um, Mr. Smith or others have about what, what we should do, then we are very will, willing and open to, to consider how, uh, how we, we do that as effectively as we can. I think the key is how people can hold the agency to account, whether that's young people or other key stakeholders. Now, as, as the bill stands at the moment, um, ministers have the power to alter the agency's aims by regulation, to approve the action plan, to decide the location of the headquarters, to issue direction to the agency without consulting the agency, which is slightly different from, from high. Um, so the bill is very clear on how the agency is held to account in reports to government ministers. Uh, but what mechanisms are specifically in place to make sure the agency is being held to account by local stakeholders in the local community? Um, well, uh, it is absolutely right that all public agencies are held to account through ministers and through ministers in turn to parliament. We are all elected, uh, and that is the principal way. I mean, that's why we are here. We are in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, you hold the executive to account, and that must always be the main way that accountability is exercised through the democratic system we have. I think the, 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 the key element, it seems to me, of the question that Mr Smith fair, quite fairly raises is how the local communities feel that they are, uh, a, are, are um, served by the new body. And I think in part it's really up to the new body to develop methods of communication. For example, uh, whereas there will be a headquarters, there has to be a headquarters, Nonetheless, the intention, as I understand it, is for the body to have a presence uh, throughout uh, many parts of the um, south of Scotland enterprise area, not to be based in one office, you know, in, in Newton St Boswells or Dumfries or anywhere else, but to have a presence, to use co-location with other public bodies. The South of Scotland Economic Partnership issues a newsletter it has held 26 meetings, a tremendous power of work, and some of my colleagues were involved in, in attending a great many of these meetings in the evening uh, after the working day was over. So there's been a tremendous positive amount of work that's done. I'm sure Mr Smith will want to welcome that positive work that's been done thus far. And already the, uh, the partnership as the precursor to the statutory body has, I think, shown that, that it's... Uh, absolutely determined to reach out to local communities and I think the action plan will deal with that uh, and the oversight by this parliament and indeed by myself will make sure that that local engagement and accountability is very much at the heart of the operations of the new statutory body. But, but would it be a fair observation, however, to say that at the moment the bill is silent when it comes to local accountability? It's very clear when it comes to government accountability, but when it comes to how we develop local accountability, the bill at the moment is silent and simply saying that we hope the agency might do it. Is that, does that go far enough? Should that not be an obligation on the agency within legislation to make sure that those mechanisms are put in place to hold the body to account locally? Well, I, I wouldn't accept that as the, as the characterisation of the the bill. I mean, this is not a plot against local accountability. Uh, I mean, the bill sets out as one of its uh, provisions in the aims section, section five, supporting community organisations to help them meet the community's needs. It's already reaching out to, a, to communities. I, I think it is up to the agency to develop the best ways, given the unique geography and circumstances of Dumfries and Galloway and the borders, about the best ways to deliver that. And, you know, convener, if there are any particular suggestions that this committee has about specific examples 
about local accountability and, and how, on, how a framework can be set up to deliver that in specific ways. Well, you know, I'm happy to work with the committee uh, on looking at that and seeing whether these are matters for the bill or for the action plan or for the body itself. We're open to and we're actively working on uh, how we make the body as accountable as possible. Um, but I think, to be fair to ourselves, if there are specific suggestions about how to do that best, that would really help rather than just general remarks uh, of, uh, uh, on, the, on the topic. Colin, uh, just before you push on, can I bring Gail yeah, in and then yeah. come back to you? Sorry, Gail. Um, will, like HIE, a member of the agency, sit in the local community planning partnership? Well, there will be close links with the community planning, and that, that is an obvious way in which I'm glad Ms Ross mentioned that, because I, I, I should perhaps have mentioned that in fairness to Mr Smith, that working with the community planning partnerships will be very much a, a way to do that. I mean, if I can give an example from HIE about what one of the things they're doing at the moment, and Mr Finney will be aware of this, I know, is his interest in the funicular railway is that um, a senior official and officials indeed from HIE have been working with the local community in the uh, area served by funicular in order to navigate the, the very significant challenges faced by the structural problems uh, that have arisen in the funicular railway. It's a model, frankly, of working with communities. They've, they've received widespread recognition from community leaders, councillors and others that they've reached out to the community, set up meetings to discuss something of real concern. You know, I mean, people don't really want to, to have a, a kind of South of Scotland enterprise official, you know, coming chapping at their door for no reason. But when there's a problem, when there's an issue, that's really when there's an expectation that the enterprise body really gets in a boot it, as I would say, goes to speak to people, to hear what they've got to say. And I, the example I give is a very difficult topic, but one where the community engagement, I think, is, has been um, uh, an excellent example of how, it, how things should operate at this level. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, when uh, the various evidence sessions we had, we had conflicting views whether uh, the two councils should be represented on the board. One council thought it, uh, council's representative thought it was a bad idea, the other one thought it might be a good idea. Do you have a view? Um, I, I think that the, that, um, the, it, it would not be desirable for there to be automatic positions on the board. But, of course, councillors are welcome to apply for membership of the board and have their applications considered along with everybody else. Um, you know, there are, there are many public bodies that arguably have uh, an interest, a perspective, a contribution to make. I personally think that um, the system we have of public appointments means that we, we have a system designed to, to pick the best people that apply, and the real challenge is actually to get the best people to put their names forward in the first place. Um, I have seen, I think Elaine Murray suggested that ministerial appointment was the, the, the way to go, and she will be aware, as a minister formerly herself, of the public appointments process and be familiar with, the, um, with, with, the, with that uh, uh, process. Councillors do, of course, uh, play a part in many, many public bodies. For example, SNH, for example, uh, Councillor uh, Stephen O'Hagan from um, Orkney sits on Visit Scotland. So there are many examples of councillors playing an active part in many other public bodies, and I think that's the model we should follow. Okay, we'll move on to the next question, which is Peter Chapman. Peter. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, the Enterprise and Skills Reviews recommended the establishment of a strategic board to align and coordinate the activities of Scotland's enterprise and skills agencies. Now, the board was created in November 2017 and its strategic plan was published in November 2018. And the Bell team confirmed that the South of Scotland agency would be part of that strategic board. So given the importance of the strategic board to the Scottish Government's enterprise and skills reform agenda, why is there no mention of it in either the Bell or the policy memorandum? <coughs> Um, well, as I understand it, the strategic board is not a creature of statute. That uh, it um, is, is a, an arrangement that's been set up in partnership, and therefore it does not appear in any sta in any uh, act of parliament. I mean that that's no reason 
for it not being mentioned in this bill if it's felt that that would make a, a useful contribution. But the arrangements for the way the strategic board works, and I wasn't the minister that set it up, it was Keith Brown was dealing with that, but the arrangements I understand are informal and agreed, uh, and that both HIE and uh, SOSE will, will automatically have a, a place, uh, place uh, on the strategic board represented, I think, by the chairman and chief executive, and that's, I think, right and proper, actually. Um, so I, I don't. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point to make. It's one I'll check up and pursue just in case there's anything I've missed, convener. Um, but I, I think the answer is that it's not a creature of statute, so you don't really expect it to appear in, in statutes. I don't think there's been any necessary amendment to the Acts of Parliament setting up either Scottish Enterprise or HIE, so far as I'm aware. Um, and so there was no real need. To a, to do so here, but you know the committee has raised it. We we will give it further thought and come back to you if there's anything else we have to add. Thank you. Well, I, I, I welcome Governor Secretary's uh, answer there. That that's that's useful. Let's see where we end up with that. My second question is: is, is what level of involvement will the Scottish Government have in setting and approving the new agencies? business plans and budgets? Now, it's probably a more meaty subject than the last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, the, the budget responsibility is, is one for the Scottish Government working with the, the Parliament, as which we're acutely aware at the moment. Um, and the budget will be decided through the normal budget process, as is the case for Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, the action plan has to be prepared by SOSE, and it and any modification must be approved by um, ministers, this is the process that uh, exists in respect of both Scottish Enterprise and HIE. Uh, I think it, it works it works fairly smoothly. And of course, a parliamentary committees are quite entitled to and to do uh, ho hold me and the heads of these bodies to account whenever the occasion should arise. But the action plan is, uh, you know, the management of day to day, is management of operations. It's the basis for the management of day-to-day -day operations. And it is an executive function, which I think is rightly performed by the agencies, statutory agencies involved, subject to oversight by the minister to make sure that there is oversight, that the aims are being fulfilled, and that the budget is being deployed in the most effective manner in order to deliver the aims most effectively. Do, do we... Do we have a figure in mind, Cabinet Secretary, of what the new agency's budget is likely to be? Uh, well, we do, and the, they're not only in mind, but they're in writing. <coughs> and they're, uh, they're, the, there is detail set out in the financial memoranda. I think there's kind of two points I'd like to make. I mean, the figures are the figures that are there in the record, but there's two points I'd like to make. One is that I think, broadly speaking, although there were different views expressed, there was broad agreement that there should be an equivalence of the budget as between the South of Scotland and the HIE. Um, I, there are different views on this, but I think that was the broad conclusion of most people. Um, I think perhaps initially they may have been concerned in, in the South of Scotland that they were going to be shortchanged, putting it bluntly. And a, therefore, uh, you know, I, I think the commitment that the Scottish Government has made in principle to this, uh, to this uh, approach has uh, assuaged any such concerns. The second point I make is that there has to be a gradual um, assumption of responsibilities. The, uh, the way we envisage this going ahead is that obviously the new body has to be set up, it has to acquire staff, it has to acquire premises. Uh, that will take time. It has to find its feet. It, uh, the board will will be appointed gradually, I think, and not in a one -er. So it will take time before it's ready to assume its full responsibilities, and equally it will take time before it's ready to be able to operate its budget on a full level. Uh, so I just make those two points, and I hope I've just kept them quite general. Um, I, I'm quite sure officials could fill in the rest of the time convener with uh, more detail if you want, but, but uh, happy to answer, answer any supplementaries on this. We, we, we certainly don't need to fill in time. We've got lots of questions on the All budget, right. which I'm going to take now. And Stuart, I'll come back to your questions later. Uh, John, I'd like to take yours, and then I'd like Thanks. to take one from Mike as well. Yes, uh, Peter Chapman's taken us on to the financial memorandum, I think, and uh, this whole area of the comparability with HIE. And 
you know, we've just done the Islands Bill and there are clearly huge challenges uh, with the islands in particular, but also the highlands. That there, It's a very remote area. Some of the areas are, are really miles and miles away from a railway or anything like that. So to slightly play the part of devil's advocate, you know, we really are surely not saying that the issues in the south of Scotland are the same scale as HIE, and surely the funding per head it is not justifiable to have the same in the south of Scotland as in the Highlands and Islands. <laughs> um, it's interesting, a, a Glasgow MSP is making this observation. <laughs> um, I, I think that, broadly speaking, the, the consensus is correct, that in principle there should be equivalence. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the, the south of Scotland has many similarities with Highlands and Islands in, te in terms of <coughs> sparsity of population, in terms of the predominance of very small businesses, in terms of the number of very small communities. In that respect, there's, there's more in common, I think, with the Highlands and Islands than there is with the Central Belt, with respect, which uh, is uh, entirely differently composed in terms of its uh, population. The population density is 24 people per kilometre, per square kilometre. Um, so the South is the most sparsely populated area outside the Highlands and Islands, and 53% of the population of the South live in remote small towns. I mean, that's an entirely different situation from the Central Belt issues. Um, and there are also, I, and Mr. Mr. Mason is well aware of issues about deprivation generally and, and poverty works on, on these issues assiduously. But, you know, there's hidden poverty in, in rural areas. It's not so obvious, it's not perhaps so, uh, so vocal. Uh, but it's, it's there, and uh, some of the most uh, deprived uh, a, a, a areas may exist in, in rural parts of Scotland as well. The last thing I would say is, is a sort of general point that you know, HIE has helped promote the Highlands and Islands you know, for tourism, mm -hmm. for renewable energy, uh, to use its marine resource. These have been big success stories. I think there's a slight feeling in the south of Scotland that although there's great success stories, they haven't had the same... Um, coverage, the same airtime, uh, the same promotion. That's something that uh, struck me in as many engagements in the south of Scotland. Um, now, whether that's right or whether that's wrong, I think having a, 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 a budget roughly on the same level as HIE will, uh, uh, over time, convener, allow the new body to do what HIE has helped to do over its... Uh, it's uh, four or five decades, five, over five decades now of existence. I hope it won't take that long, incidentally. I'm sure it won't. But, uh, uh, you know, I think there is that feeling that the south of Scotland needs to have a stronger recognition. And the budget, I think, is necessary to, to, to deliver that. I mean, if I can just say that, I mean, I completely agree with really what the Cabinet Secretary has said. It's a rural area. There's, there's poverty in rural areas. A lot of it's very remote. Uh, there are similar issues to HIE. So, I mean, all of that I agree with. I think it's a question of scale. I mean, last Wednesday, we went down to Gala Shields in an hour on a perfectly good train and came back again on a perfectly good train. Um, uh, there is nowhere in the Highlands and Islands I can get to within an hour of this parliament. Uh, so it, it's a question of degree. And if uh, HIE has got roughly one member of staff for every 1,500 population, SE... Scottish Enterprise, about one for every 3,000. And, and that's absolutely fine, and I'm happy with that. But my, I think my question is, you know, if South of Scotland electricity, uh, electricity, South, uh, yeah, South of too. Scotland <laughs> Enterprise is going to be, a, you know, have more than SE, I agree, but should it be the same as Highlands and Islands, or it, should it be somewhere in the middle? And I, th I think my just question is, as somebody from the Central Belt who's happy to support a, an emphasis in the South of Scotland, a, Surely, it, does it really need to be at the same level as HIE? Um, well, you no know, doubt these arguments will run and run, but you know, our proposal is there should be broad equivalence and the budget allocation of uh, 220, 21, 21, 22, 22, 23. Um, the, the proposed total budget allocation is 32, 37, 42 million for those three years respectively. And that's, that's envisaging this, this gradual ramping up of responsibilities so that once it's able uh, 
to discharge them, it has the budget to do so. Um, I think it's important also, I'll just make this final point, convener, that you know, the new body does impress, it does act, it does make a difference quickly um, to show that it's worthwhile. And to do that, the, the budget that uh, we envisage will enable it uh, to do that. And I'm quite confident that, you know, that, that will happen in a variety, uh, a variety of, of different ways. But I, I take the general, uh, a, uh, general points that um, the devil's advocate is making. And, and, and I should point out, although we did go down to Gala Shields on a perfectly good train, half the committee was standing like a huge amount of people on the train, so it might have been good. It was somewhat overcrowded, which I think is a, a phenomenal problem down there. But we'll perhaps pass on that and move to Mike with the next question. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, when we were in Dumfries and Gala Shields, there seemed to be a tremendous amount of confusion from the people that we were taking evidence from, formally and informally, as to about the, the, the 42 million, um, which the minister just just mentioned now, uh, according to the financial memorandum, um, staff costs will be approximately 10 million pounds, and the budget will build to, as the minister just said, 42 million pounds. So my question really is focused on: Is this what people were terming to us new money? In other words, additional money that's coming in to set up this enterprise? agency, or is it money that was allocated anyway, or it will be would, would have been allocated anyway to other agencies and even the, um, even with the council development agencies. And so my question is, is a simple one, but I think it's quite an important one. Is this new money, or is it coming from other development budgets? Um, well, um the budgets for um, the years 2020 21 haven't been set, so, mm -hmm. you know, in a strict purest terms, uh, the money is not coming from any other budgets because there are none. Um, but uh, a simple answer is that there is this, uh, the, the budget of 42 million, which would be in year three of operation, represents an increased overall funding for the area. I think Mr. Rumbles makes a point that, you know, this is a new body, it's a new body coming in to provide a function that we, we all, I think, believe has got the potential to do a lot of good. Um, the more good it does will be a factor of its working effectively with the other, particularly with the councils. And the key area is how uh, the councils and uh, the statutory body uh, cooperate, and in particular how the business gateway services, which mm. Mr Rumbles knows, are designed local authority-led and designed to, to assist smaller businesses uh, dovetail with the activities of the uh, statutory body. And that process, that relationship, is obviously something that there's been discussion about already, constructive, amicable discussion between the Scottish Government and local authorities at a high level. But I, I think it will need to be the subject of further discussion about how we get the best deal for the public, for all sizes of businesses. And that may, may result in, you know, um, some people who are currently, uh, Mr. Rumble's working in local economic development roles in local authorities, deciding to take up positions mm -hmm. in the new agency. Mm -hmm. And whether or not local authorities will wish to continue as is, or look at reshaping their economic development functions and departments, is obviously very much a matter for active discussion and debate amongst all to get the best outcome overall. So, um, so a, you know, I hope that that gives an overview of uh, the question Mr. Rumbles poses, um, but overall there will be an increase in, in the funding for the area for economic development. I, I can imagine there would be an increase. My question is not a, a critical question, if I can put it that way. I'm very keen that this succeeds, and I think it's a very good good thing, and the, the government's um, bill is a very good bill. Um, but I'm just trying to make sure that um, expectations aren't unduly raised by people who have given us evidence and who we've engaged with, because there seems to be a, uh, an understanding. Certainly, I got that at, 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 at Gala Shields when I was there with other members of the committee, um, that this was, e this was all going to be extra money coming in. And I, I just wondered if you could give us an idea 
I know you've just said there will be more money. But some of this money is going to be new money. Whether the minister has any idea, I know budgets haven't been set to 20. 20 I mean, in fact, we're going to vote on the budget tomorrow uh, for next year's budget. But can you give us an idea of how much of that budget is actually new money, just so that we can make it clear to people who have been uh, approaching us? Well, I think that computation would be an extremely complex one to perform. And I'm not sure, uh, and this is not meant to be a sort of concoction of Sir Humphrey, but I'm not sure if the statistical evidence is available in the form that the member seeks. Um, and the reason for that is that I'm not sure that Scottish Enterprise has done a geographical analysis of the deployment of its budget over the years. And even if it did, it would show massively differing amounts of money because, you know, a, a large investment in one year may be, may be followed by a lack of large investments in subsequent years. Um, I think overall there will be an increase in funding, quite substantial increase in funding for the area. I'm not able to say how much more it would be, but you know we listen to what the committee raises. It's the point, it's accountability. We can go back and we'll have a look again at, at the question. I think uh, preparatory to stage two, uh, um, and there we are. The last thing I would say is that you know it's it's up to us all to provide leadership to to explain the, the opportunities of this new body to communicate that locally, and I'm quite sure that. That, uh, that that will be done and will engender, quite rightly, an element of, uh, of interest, expectation, uh, and we have to fulfil those expectations once we raise them. That's, our, that's one of our responsibilities. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We move on to the next question, which is Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, one of the uh, issues that has been brought up uh, with the committee um, is that uh, Scottish Enterprise will still have a role in the south of Scotland. And there seemed to be a little bit of uh, confusion about that. I note that uh, Scottish Enterprise, for example, will continue to be responsible for things like regional selective assistance and Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service in the south of Scotland. Um, Dr Murray uh, in... Uh, talking to the committee, uh, talked about memorandum of understanding between various agencies. Uh, is it your uh, understanding that that is likely to be the most effective me method of ensuring uh, that there is good collaboration and neither underlap nor overlap? Um, MOU, well, that's, that's one way of, of doing it. Um, uh, yes, you're right that SE will have continuing role, just in the same way that SE works very much with HIE in respect of areas where it has the expertise. Um, these, the Manufacturing Advisory Service is one of those areas. For example, there's no point in duplicating uh, an expert range of services in every single economic development agency. The Scottish Investment Bank is another example of um, a body where one wouldn't expect there to be three Scottish investment banks, you know, serving the three economic areas which have their own development agency. So um, whether it's by an MOU or other means, um, I think the key thing is the effective joint working. And generally, the, 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 that's a factor of how the chief executives and chairmen, our chairwomen and ministers, officials all, all act together. Um, you know, there's many, many areas where um, there is a, a, a kind of shared, a shared overlapping function between HIE and SE, for example, and um, a, you know, where necessary ad hoc arrangements are made. For example, uh, you know, task forces set up for the Le Havre Delivery Group, which I chair, where Scottish Government works with Highland Council, with HIE, with uh, SNH SEPA and a variety of other bodies. So when needs must, when there is a, a need to have that collaborative working, it exists. Um, an MOU is one way of doing it, but you know, at the end of the day, it's it's the individuals, it's the people that that uh, make these things work or not, as the case may be. And um, you know, we're not a huge country, so getting what getting everybody in a room, um, Mr. Stevenson, is one of the advantages I think we have over our good friends down south when it comes to uh, to tackling serious issues as they arise. And perhaps, finally, um, the, the, one of the balancing concerns that's been raised with the committee um, is 
that of additional bureaucracy associated with the introduction of a new board, but which is not displacing in, in entirety uh, some existing services. Um, how would the Cabinet Secretary respond to concerns that have been expressed on additional bureaucracy? Um, well, you know, bureaucracy, an element of bureaucracy is always going to be with us. Uh, uh, sometimes I wish that were not uh, uh, the truth. Um, but I think that uh, the, the aim really is to ensure that the, the body operates uh, in as efficient, an efficient a way as possible uh, and that the, the rule book is, is the servant, not the master, uh, and that uh, a, that's the way things should operate uh, quickly, responsibly, going out to speak to people, going out to find out what's happening a, a, is, the, is the way that, that things, uh, things uh, are achieved. But if there's any specific examples of uh, bureaucracy, I'm very happy to look into them and to see what can be done about them. I think the, the, the real problem of bureaucracy actually rests in more sort of complex schemes than administration thereof. I hesitate to mention the common agricultural policy or administration of uh, uh, forestry applications, but where one has a complex process for the administration of public money, you know, that tends to be the area, in my experience at least, where one has a sort of inevitable consequence that, that sometimes the process seems to be taking too long and becoming the, the object rather than the fulfilment of the process. Um, I haven't quite detected really that bureaucracy is a significant issue in many cases with the enterprise functions which tend to be a bit more proactive and kind of ad hoc in their arrangements. Although the administration of grant applications uh, can sometimes give air to, to concerns and, and issues. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all elected people here. We exist in part to, to hold public bodies to account and to get answers, to get things done as quickly and as efficient as they can be done. And that's, I think, an important and necessary part of uh, the roles that we all fulfil. Jamie, you had a question. Uh, just briefly, uh, Convener, following on from Mr Stevenson's line of questioning, uh, there was genuine concern, I guess, over the confusion of whether this agency will sit as another layer on top of Scottish Enterprise or will sit alongside. And given that there is uh, some comparison between the aims and objectives of each of the agencies and I think dubiety over whether any uh, funds will be redirected from Scottish Enterprise to the New South Scotland agency. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there may be there confusion over uh, lines of accountability uh, in terms of the objectives of each of the two separate agencies? Um, I, I don't see why there should be any such confusion. The two bodies will sit alongside each other the, they will be equals. Uh, the South of Scotland body will not be subservient. They will have an equality of, of relationship. They're different bodies. SE is bigger. It will have a bigger budget. It's serving a bigger area, a, a bigger population rather. Um, but they will be equals. It will not be a case of, uh, of Scottish Enterprise running the new agency. It will run itself. It will be the master of its own fate, uh, accountable to ministers and parliament. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I think that's all the questions we have. I mean, I would say that there's huge expectations uh, have been voiced regarding this uh, bill, and uh, the committee will have to reflect on its report. So I'd, I thank you for the evidence you've given. I would ask Cabinet Secretary if you and the witnesses could leave quietly so we may continue on with the other matters that we have on our agenda. But thank you for the time and your, that you and your team have given us this morning. Committee, I'd like to move on to agenda item three, which is European Withdrawal Act, SIs. We have received five consent notifications uh, as detailed on the agenda. These cover transport, the rules for awarding contracts, agriculture, including the transfer of legislative functions and provisions concerning financing, management and the monitoring of the common agricultural policy, policy and fisheries. All the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Of the SIs, two, well, sorry, one of the SIs is categorised as A, two of the SIs are categorised as B, and two categorised as partly B, to the extent that the transition from the EU to a UK, UK framework would be a major and significant development. Are there any comments from the committee? I note one from Stuart and then from Richard. 
um, is, is just a, a small point in relation to the cap and its replacement. Um, the, it, the denomination in which the calculation of payments is made remains as uh, euros uh, even after. But I note that it is said that that is only to allow the transition year that bridge covers both in and out and that it will subsequently be changed. And I think it's just important to put perhaps that observation on the record because I think others who read it might be slightly confused by that. But also that the, there isn't much information about when and how that bringing it back to sterling uh, would be achieved. Although I imagine that it probably is in somebody's plan. What's in front of us doesn't actually say it. Okay. I mean, as the committee is considering something to do with CAP, I should note a declaration of interest that I am a member of a farming partnership, although I don't intend to say anything on this. Uh, if anyone else is, intends to speak on this and wants to make a declaration, please do. Uh, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Camina. Just briefly, this one relates... Sorry, sorry. Oh, it sorry. should have been Richard. Yes, Richard indeed. first and then Jamie. Um, it may be a, a, a typing error or it could be a, a mistake. On page two... It says agricultural transfer of functions EU exit number two regulations 2018. But in page 10, it says agricultural transfer of functions EU exit number two regulations 2019. I will leave that for, I'll leave that, I'll, I'll leave that. It's interesting to note that in amongst this, um, wine uh, changes, cap changes, cap financing, management monitoring, there's 127 amendments, uh, which uh, is quite amazing when you go over and read them all. Um, and I thought I would throw it. And just while I'm in, I'll throw that um, when we come to the next one, the common fisheries policy transfer of functions, and people may want to uh, analyse these amendments. There are over, there are over 60 amendments in, in this uh, SI. Uh, but it'd be interesting to know if the 2018-2019 is um, just a changeover or, or a typo. We'll check that out and come back to you, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. The, my uh, query relates to the uh, public service obligations in transport, uh, uh, SI, um, which affects uh, PSO services on rail, bus and tram. Uh, I believe that the rail aspects are a whole reserve matter, but I think bus and tram areas may be uh, affected and reserved. Uh, Article 4 uh, limits the maximum duration of PSO contracts awarded under the regulation to 10 years. I just wondered, it doesn't state in the notes if that is a change from the existing cap. Is that an increase, a decrease, or it's just a continuation? It's just a query. Okay. Do, are there any other points? Uh, well, I think there's a couple of points there that require clarification, which I'm very happy uh, that the committee write to uh, the government and ask for clarification. But on the basis that we do that, is the committee agreed to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for the consent for the UK SI is referred to in the notification to be given and to request a response from the Scottish Government on the wider policies that have been identified in the papers? Yes. We agree. Thank you. The committee will now move into private. Um.